the sliding block, when will it stop? Um, so we're going to talk today about the long-term behavior of input-output systems and try to understand the final values or the, the final positions of um, input-output systems under various initial conditions or inputs. Um, and the tool we're going to use to do this is the final value theorem. So this is really a, a mini lecture about what the final value theorem is, where does it come from, and um, how do we use it. And uh, to sort of keep everything focused, we're going to study a problem involving a sliding block and try and work out when it's going to stop. So suppose we have some mass and it's sliding along the road. So maybe this is some car and it's moving along and it starts off at time t is equal to zero with some initial velocity v and we've got a variable y which gives us the position of the car uh, relative to some arbitrarily chosen um, initial point and in fact we choose our initial point so that at time t is equal to zero the position of the car is y is equal to zero and then y of t just tells you what the position of the car is in the future and uh, we're breaking um, and our, in our simple model of this uh, block, sliding block or uh, car brake um, is that it applies a force to the car that's proportional to the velocity so and there's some con uh, con constant of proportionality c. And there's no other forces so that's the setup we have this mass it's sliding along with some initial velocity there's a force trying to stop it how far is it going to go before it stops um, or written uh, mathematically, what is the limit of the value of, or the, the, yeah, the position of our car as uh, time uh, goes to infinity? So, uh, yeah, the value of the position of our car when uh, time gets very, very large. Um, and we're going to do this, uh, we're going to answer this with some Laplace transform techniques, and the technique is the final value theorem. And um, we're here we're using it to analyze the long-term behavior of this block, um, but you could imagine doing this in all sorts of other um, applications. So you've got certain references you want to track and you want to see what your system does in response to various uh, reference inputs um, in the long term. So how are we going to Laplace transform uh, things that are going on here? Well, we're going to try and get this uh, guy to drop out of a kind of a Laplace transform integral type expression. So um, how can we get a limit like this appearing out of an integral? Um, well, when we evaluate our integrals, when we write, say, this, what do we mean? We mean um, th this quantity here is equal to the limit as t tends to infinity of y of t minus y at the value t is equal to zero. So this is just what uh, th this object means. And how could we get this uh, to come out of a, an integral? Well, what do we have to integrate to get this? Um, well, we have to integrate something from naught to infinity. And we want to integrate it with respect to time. And oh, we want to actually integrate dy by dt. So we've got sort of lots of the pieces of the definition of the Laplace transform. We've got the right limits, we've got the right um, integration variable. What are we missing? We're missing our e to the minus st. And um, so how can we make this um, get us, uh, give us y of t? Well, we want this term here to be equal to 1. And to make this term equal to 1, what do we have to do? We have to set s as equal to 0. So we need to take the limit as s goes to 0 of this thing. Um, OK, fine. Um, so now we've got something that can be uh, Laplace transformed. And in fact, we've already seen how to Laplace transform exactly this. Um, so we've seen that this is just the Laplace transform of the derivative of y. And that's equal to s times the Laplace transform of y minus y of 0. So here we have lim s goes to 0 of this is equal to lim t goes to infinity of y of t minus y of 0. And this is 
basically the final value theorem. We can just tidy up these y of zeros. They don't depend on either of the limits, so there's no problem doing that. And everything that's left, this is the final value theorem. So, do we need to be a bit careful? Yes, we do. We can't just have any old thing in here. But for this to make sense, um, we need to be sure, we need to think back to our lecture on the Laplace transform, and for this limit to make sense, or for this thing that we're calling this function y of s to make sense, we have to be inside the region of convergence. So this comes with a caveat. For, for this to be true, we need the function s y of s, um, we need its region of convergence to include the point s is equal to zero. So here we've got the s plane, so this is just a, a picture of the complex plane corresponding to different values of s, and we need the region of convergence. We need the region of convergence of s y of s to include the origin. So the point we're taking our limit to has to be included in the region of convergence of s, y of s. What does that mean? It means that s, y of s cannot have any, basically it means that s, y of s cannot have any poles um, in, in the region like this. So s times y of s needs to be stable, have all of its poles in the left half plane, is what this means in practice. And so subject to this condition, we have the final value theorem, and that's what we're going to use to solve our problem here. So let's just do it. Um, so how are we going to make some progress here? We don't, we, we see y, but uh, maybe it's not clear how y is related to everything else. And we need to do just a, a little bit of basic physics, um, and we need to apply Newton's law. So what does Newton's law say? It says f is equal to ma. And what is our force in this case? Our force is minus c times y dot. We've got the minus sign because the force is pointing this way and our variable y is being measured as positive in that direction. And this is equal to m times the acceleration, which is y double dot. Okay, good. We're making progress. Now, in order to apply the, apply the final value theorem, um, we need to get the Laplace transform of y which means we're going to have to Laplace transform this expression here. And to do that, we're going to have to use our rule for relating the derivatives or the Laplace transform of the derivatives of y to the Laplace transform of y. So let's just do that. And so we have minus c, and then just like we saw last time, the Laplace transform of y dot is equal to s times the Laplace transform of y minus y of 0. Fine. And what's this is equal to? Well, this is equal to m, and now we need to do the Laplace transform of y double dot, and this is equal to s times the Laplace transform of y dot, but the Laplace transform of y dot is given by this thing, so we've got an s squared y minus s y of 0, and then we also have a minus y dot of 0. So, this is the Laplace transform of y double dot, um, just by recursively applying that rule that we saw last time. And now we're almost there. Let's just collect together the things that depend on y and put them on the left-hand side and move everything else over to the right-hand side. So and let's uh, put a, a handy uh, flip some minus signs here to help us. So what do we get? We get csy, so that's that term, plus m s squared y, that's that term there, and this is equal to, so let's move this one over, so we have a c y of 0, and then we have a, we've got these minus signs cancel out, so we've got a plus m s y of 0, and then we have a plus m y dot of 0. Almost there now, let's just end up. So we, we, we want to know what y of s is, so we need to get everything else on the left, and we find that if we do that, we find that y of s is equal to uh, just this thing again, so c y of 0 plus m s y of 0 plus m y dot of 0, all divided by 
m s squared plus c s. OK, we found y of s. Um, to apply the final value theorem, we need to find s times y of s. So let's do that. Um, so multiplying here by s, and then we just multiply the right hand side by s as well. But actually, we've got a we've got a, a common factor of s in the denominator here. So multiplying by s is just the same as getting rid of those terms there. And now we're ready. We just need to take the limit as s goes to zero. So lim s goes to zero. What happens? Well, lim s goes to zero kills that term. It kills that term. And then we, need, we can also substitute in for our initial conditions and we conveniently defined our coordinate system so y of zero was equal to zero. And so that term also goes. And at the end of it all, we're left with the whole thing being equal to mv, the, that's our initial velocity, um, divided by c. And there we go. By applying the final value theorem, we've been able to find um, the limiting value of y, for, which tells us when the sliding block uh, will stop. And as we can see, it depends on the mass and uh, the velocity. So things with big mass and high initial velocity will go further. Um, and also, if we have a bigger damping coefficient, that will mean it goes less far. So small damping, high velocity, high mass all mean that the sliding block will not stop for, uh, will go further. Um, yeah, there we go. Bye.